Hello everyone and welcome to the brand new exciting Let's Play on this channel. This is Vampire the Masquerade Coteries of New York, a new Vampire the Masquerade game, an official one, officially approved by White Wolf and given to us as an appetizer before Borderlands 2 by the studio called Draw Distance. This game features the v5 lore and is actually canon to the modern v5 lore of vampire the masquerade so whatever is going to happen in this game is going to be canonically a part of what's happened to vampire the masquerade lore and it makes me super excited to actually explore it and i hope you guys will be into exploring it with me i will be starting a brand new play for i did play this game before a bit because i had the alpha builds but I will be starting the game from a position from a clan that I haven't tried before. Clan Torator, one of my favorite clans of Vampire the Masquerade. And uh, yeah, I cannot wait to start it, so let's go! Once we start the game, you can have three slots. Uh, as you can see, there are my old saves from my previous playthroughs. I will pick the empty one. And I can pick in between Bruja, Ventru and Toreador, the rabble rebel against power and rage against authority. A seemingly insignificant man with significant ideas will join the ranks tonight. That's the guy. Also, we can't actually change the appearance of the characters, so this is what you are set with. Uh, when you play as Bruja, you are forced to play as a male, but when you play as Ventru, you actually play as a woman. The aristocratic bluebloods embody wealth, sovereignty and control. A top-level corporate executive will join their ranks tonight. And Torator? The generates seek frills of art, romance and cruelty amidst stagnant and death. It actually doesn't write whether I am a high member of society or just someone insignificant in here, so that's... Uh, quite intriguing, but anyway, when it comes to the clans, uh, they do determine a lot of things in the gameplay. The gameplay, as you probably know if you watched my previous video, is mostly dialogue-based, it's a visual novel with uh, narrative elements, with some uh, small gameplay elements here and there, and uh, because of that, the choice of your clan will probably have a lot of weight on various choices, on various uh, events in the game itself. And uh, for example, you start from a different place. I don't know where to Reader starts, but I know for sure that Ventra starts in the corporation as a corporate rat. So I'm going to pick Torator, accept it. So the name of my character set by the game is Lamar, but I'm going to actually change it a little bit. I'm going to change it to Lafayette to give a tribute to one of my favorite characters from the show True Blood. So let's go with Lafayette and accept it. New York taught me to believe in fate. Had you asked me about the fate back when I was human, I would have told you it's just superstitious bullshit. That we are all designers of our own destinies. That belief shattered when the richest woman in the United States, the actual richest one, not a face you could have seen in the papers, of course, sunk her teeth deep into my neck. It happened in the very same place you're standing in right now, by the way. Fate? You decide. This is not me, by the way, this is someone else. Please, there is absolutely no need to be hostile. Just listen for a little longer. You see, my mistake was, I flew too close to the sun. It makes sense that my punishment was to never see its glow again. I was incandescent myself. I was hot shit. I had it all. Money, looks, confidence, connections, men, women, a career and a spark in the eye. The one you need to be born with. And that's when someone far more powerful than me saw my radiance and thought, that won't do. She robbed me of the light erupting from within me and gave me a subtle, enduring gleam in its place. She decided it would fit me much better. She was a ninth generation kindred, just like you. An apex predator. She probably enjoyed showing me a peak of human excellence. My real place in the food chain. Huh, interesting. So, um, I'm not really sure what's going on in there, but a ninth generation kindred would be considered an elder with the current lore. And the current lore of Vampire the Masquerade V5 says that every vampire, maybe not every, but most of the vampires which are of generation 9 and older and uh, lower, they do feel the calling of the beconing which calls them to join the kindred war in the Middle East and um, 
a lot of the elders disappear from their cities. That's why the situation in the United States, the situation, the political situation, the uh, princehoods, the domains change so rapidly because a lot of the elder vampires just disappeared. And uh, given the place to the youngsters, and that's why also we have so many film buds these days. So maybe this ninth generation kindred is not there anymore because she was called by the beckoning, but we don't know. We will know later on, I guess. It's such an eyesore when you look at some loudmouth braggart and see them for all they really are. The temptation to teach them a lesson can be unbearable, right? Well, my Cyrus lesson was a lesson about fate. A message saying, you're eternally doomed to being at the mercy of your sovereigns. It almost drove me to destroy myself. What saved me was the ability to reinterpret her teachings. Hers wasn't a message of doom, it was a message of hope. Faith exists, and one can shape it if given the right tools. My sire didn't believe my tools were fitting for the job. She considered them toys, and me just her amusing subject. Well, she's deader than dead now, and I'm still here, standing right where she stood when we first met. met. Well, so she was not called to the beckoning, I see, but she died. Maybe she died in the war, though. Who knows? You might have wondered how I've learned about your arrival to JFK airport. My answer is, of course, destiny. As luck would have it, the day happens to be a day some of my associates were inspecting the coffins. Driving you here straight from the plane and having you wake up in such an unfamiliar place was a little desperate, and I do apologize for it. But it is so rare for you to visit New York, three times in the last 15 years, was it? And you're never eager to inform me you're here. This person is talking to someone else than the main character, I think. Because we are a fledgling, we are a fleshy embraced one as far as I know. So this is, this is different people talking. I understand you still have that meeting on 51st Street later tonight. So I'll provide a comfortable transport. I value our relationship very much, don't get that wrong. But it is precisely because I value it that I'm going to ask you to repay the favor you owe me. You're the only one I'd trust to do the job well, and without attracting attention. You might think I'm crazy asking you to breach the rules of our society like this. You might think you won't get away with it unpunished. But this is New York, and I don't know about other cities, but in this one, fate really exists. And right now, it's smiling in your favor. This is how it begins. You stifle a yawn. It's been a slow evening. A gallery, I see. A torator, fitting place. The little bit of red liquid left in your glass and the crumbs on the plate remind you that, if nothing else, these art exhibitions at least come with some decent wine and alleged catering. And yeah, it's fun to talk about your work on display, even if you end up discussing it with pretty much the same people at each such occasion. You've already met that one critic who keeps telling you, with self-assured authority, how you should pursue a different artistic avenue. Then there's the obligatory doe-eyed art student who's oh so impressed with your technique. To be fair, you're not all that happy with your latest piece, but hey, it's not the worst thing you've seen tonight. That ignoble, dubious honor belongs to one of the other paintings on display. And yet, its author, currently being paraded around by his rich parents, has barely been able to grab a bite of the fancy canapés. So many psychophants to meet, so little time. For a moment, you think that maybe it's not worth it. Maybe you should take the critic's advice, cut your losses, sell out to some corporation and get it over with. And as if the universe wanted to validate that train of thought, that's the exact moment your sister Emma decides to pop up in your view. Emma. So let me get this straight. Cushy corporate jobs are selling out, but supporting a billionaire's vanity project is totally fine with you. I am. You absolutely despise her as an artist. While you're struggling to uphold some nebulous ideals of what art is meant to be, she's perfecting her ways of mooching off the system. Shamelessly preying on little known street art and niche internet memes, she repackages them as bourgeois friendly colleges. So it's perhaps no wonder the New York Times has recently dubbed her a mind-blowing explorer of digital art's extreme possibilities. 
But in spite of all that, you absolutely love her as a person, even as you welcome her by smacking the back of her head, a gesture meant to convey nothing but deep affection. Aww. No, but seriously, supporting yoga artist, my ass. I don't know what kind of money you got for this piece, but I doubt it was even a fraction of what it's going to be worth in tax benefits. The gallery owner actually said that if he had to choose his most valuable audience, it would be the IRS. And I'm pretty sure he was only half kidding. You mumble an unanswer and then sick into a different subject, trying to preemptively quell her repeated offers to get you a steady job. Of course, she proves as insistent as ever. You know, sometimes I just don't get you. On the one hand, you wouldn't be caught dead taking money from the inevitable winner of the culture wars. On the other, if someone gave you the chance to collaborate on some dumbass Oscar bait flick sponsored by Larry Ellison's bailout fund, you do that shit for free. She rolls her eyes and asks, you know what the only difference is between the art scene and the culture industry? The culture industry actually pays your fucking bills. <laughs> As expected of someone who's given up on attempts to infuse her work with any sort of enduring quality and decided to just keep responding to the zeitgeist. She claims to happily accept the fact that after she dies, both she and her work will end up in a landfill. When you respond that you prefer chasing a one in a million chance to immortalize yourself, she claims it reeks of an overinflated ego. <laughs> well, I feel we will sure soon get the chance to immortalize your work in a perfectly proper way. But you've been down this road too many times before and managed to accept she'll never understand what's truly important to you. Slowly but surely, you move on to more agreeable topics. Your plans to finally get hammered together or the most recent crop of garbage Netflix shows your friends have tricked you into trying out. Alright, gotta go. I've got a date. She picks at a bunch of middle-aged men in expensive suits who have stopped pretending to care about the exhibition and are exchanging the worst lecherous jokes they've got in their stale repertoire. Have fun with your friends, class trader. She gives you a hug and heads for a nearby elevator. There goes the pleasant part of the evening. Still, you decide to delay the inevitable and catch a quick smoke break. Not a good idea, not at night, in New York. Truth be told, people aren't exactly lining up to chat about your work anyway. Hmm. As you leave your post, you start tapping your pockets in search for a lighter. Instead, you find a hundred dollar bill you're absolutely sure wasn't there before. Jesus Christ, Em, you're the worst. And the best. You can feel your cheeks turn red, but you gratefully put the money in your wallet and move outside. <laughs> they should literally give us some money, <laughs> because we don't earn. When you reach the balcony, you look out at the New York City and light the second last cigarette left in the pack. You're alone. It's not silent. The metropolitan hum is ever-present, even this high up. But it's a good deal more intimate than what's behind your back. You lean over the railing and look down. The street lights become more than usual. In your mind's eye, you see yourself as your final artwork, beautifully splattered all over the pavement. Working title, Delusion of Grandeur. The author, a brilliant artistic soul crushed by unfeeling reality, gone too soon. You chuckle and flick the cigarette into the air. Freshened up by the night school breeze, you squeeze back into the stuffy interior. You barely make it a few steps before a lethargy sets back in. It's like you never left. Still, something in the room feels different. Your eyes are drawn to a handsome young man, neatly dressed and groomed, exuding the air of a true artiste. And the best part? He's intently looking at your painting. The gallery is almost like an art installation itself now, people standing in silent awe, the guy like a beacon drawing everybody's attention. <laughs> Mr. Torrader, probably using the disciplined presence and his uh, ability called awe, which makes people attract attention to him in the room. And uh, it is not actually a masquerade breach, basically it's when you are, for example, in the club, in the dance club, and then you see that one person on the dance floor that attracts everyone's eyes and everyone is just like inclined to look at her because her moves are just exquisite and she's dressed beautifully and there's something about her. And that person, you know, would be a torreator using awe in this universe. 
Hush conversations about the guests can be heard from every corner of the gallery. Your heart is pounding with excitement, and you approach, feeling like a kid trying to get close to the deer in the woods, but afraid you'll scare it away. The man turns to you, and you stop in your tracks and trance. So, this is one of your pieces. You manage to mumble an affirmation. Tell me about it, please. As you start discussing your inspiration, technique and process, the man's eyes lock onto the painting again. He keeps interjecting, making knowing remarks. This guy gets it, he really gets it! The world around you disappears. He'll say anything, do anything to keep his attention on you. But you realize you don't need to. He's into your art, he's into you. Either all or entrancement. It's another ability of Torators who actually are able to make that single person absolutely infatuate with themselves or infatuated with themselves for a short amount of time, but it really works. I want to buy it and I want your company. I need to talk to you. You will like what I have to say. Spoken matter-of-factly, served straight up, like he knows that you won't refuse, that you can refuse. An hour later, you find yourself at his apartment, one of many, you presume, with your self-esteem all but patched up and your head full of fine vintage. You tell your host a lot. In fact, it seems like you're telling him everything. Where you came from, how you ended up in New York City, how you had to take out a loan to appear at tonight's event, how you took the long look down the balcony, that you thought about taking the plunge and this time you were only half joking. You feel miserable. You start crying. He holds you in his arms. You feel calmer. The tears stop flowing. It's been so long since you last had someone you could not just talk to, but communicate with, be seen by. Who knows? Maybe there is hope for you yet. That feeling of bliss is the last thing you remember before passing out. Next thing you know, you're lying on the couch in the same apartment, hungry and dehydrated. How long has it been? Hours? Days? More? You're feeling weak, confused, abandoned. You look around in panic. Is he still here? Thank God, yes, there he is, standing in the doorway. His voice breaks the silence and fills you with hope. Until you realize what he's saying. I am so sorry. I hope that maybe one night you will forgive me. Always remember that in your parting moment I wished you well. You try to speak, ask him to say, stay, but no voice leaves your parched throat. You taste something in your lips, wiping your mouth leaves a crimson stain on your hand. It's not the wine, what the fuck? The door of the apartment closes behind him, alone, again. Then the pain hits. It's a headache, a lurching in your stomach, a burning in your arms, legs. It's all you can focus on, a panic takes you. You fall from the sofa and hit a wine glass. It flies off into a wall, shattering into bits. A mumble from the corner of the room indicates that you're not as alone as you thought. From where you're lying, you only see a feminine shape, steering awake. You crawl towards the woman. Inch by inch, the pain turns into an urge. You want, you need to get close to her. You begin to see details, the long hair shrouding her face, the worn-out New York University hoodie thrown over her skimpy peach-colored dress. She opens her eyes, moves her locks to the side, exposes her neck. A rapid instinct takes you. In the blink of an eye, you find yourself buried in her hair, smelling her sweat mixed with just a hint of cheap perfume. You bite down and drink the blood from her vein. Wait. Wait. Wait, wait, what is happening? You break away, you look at the girl, she lets out a sigh, goes limp and unconscious again. You try to crawl back, her dress rolled up to the side and you glance at her naked thigh. You lose control again, bite her leg, drink deep from the artery. It's intoxicating, it's bliss like you've never known before, it's beautiful. You break away again, fall to your back. What the hell was that? Did you really drink her blood? She's not moving. Oh god, she's not moving. You check her pulse. She's called to the touch. Nothing. 
no heartbeat, no sign of breathing. That's when it hits you, your chest isn't moving either, your heart is not beating, you are cold to the touch. Can I just say one thing? Fuck our sire! What a horrible piece of shit of vampire being who left us with a freaking victim and caused us to get this close to losing our humanity at the very start of our own life. What a prick. Damn. You reach for your phone. It's not there. Where did you leave it? Or maybe he took it? Impossible to say. You stumble around the apartment but find nothing you can use to call for help. Hey, I got the achievement. <laughs> you need to get out of here. Now. You look outside the window. You're high above the streets. There's no balcony. And the building's exterior is glass almost all the way down. You'd never survive the jump. Well, maybe that's precisely why you should leave the room this way. You've just killed somebody. Your life is essentially over. A sickening void is opening in your stomach, warning you that your reality is about to turn into unbearable hell. It's a good premonition you have in there. A voice in the back of your head tells you that the smartest course of action is to take the leap before it does. And the more you argue with it, the more reasonable it sounds. You're just about ready to pick up one of the chairs and try to break the window when you hear the clicking of keys in the lock. You freeze in place. This is bad. Your thoughts start racing desperately, but instead of a rational course of action, only visions of false hope come to your mind. What if it's him? What if he's had a change of heart? What if he sent someone for me? You almost feel your heart beat again with excitement as the doors open. Almost, but not quite. A man enters, but not the one you expected. He's tall, broad-shouldered, handsome, with darkish skin. His suit is stylish and immaculate. You've never seen him in your life, but you immediately see past his sharp looks to see his sharper nature. He is a predator. And if you're not careful, you might become his prey. Good evening. I'm here to pick you up. A deep, emotionless voice. He turns his eyes to the lifeless body of the girl in the purple NYU hoodie and raises an eyebrow. Who are you? I'm the ferryman, here to take you to the other side. He approaches the bed to examine the corpse from up close. Well, this is unfortunate, but preferable to going insane from hunger. Quite a nice gesture, actually, if troublesome. Hmm. He briefly looks at you with something like pity in his eyes, then changes his expression to a perfectly blank one. Listen. You may perceive your current situation as something out of the ordinary, but I've met hundreds of lost sheep like you, and you see, they tended to fall into two categories. First, there were the smart ones, those who carefully obeyed my every word and didn't pull off any stupid stunts. They always got where they needed to go safe and sound. Then there were the dumb ones, the punks who thought they could take me on, the wise guys who tried to contact somebody secretly and without permission, the troublemakers who tried to run off or make a scene. None of them got to their destination in one piece. In fact, a lot of them never reached their destination at all. The man talks in a bored, professional tone, giving off an impression that he really has delivered this speech countless times by now. So you see, despite being a smart person, I am a Mets fan. I love baseball. And it inspired me to come up with a free strike system to determine if someone is dumb. If you get on my nerves one or two times, well, I understand. Not all of us perform well in stressful circumstances. But if you do it three times, understand that there will be no excuse, no forgiveness and no mercy. This presence changes ever so slightly. Say, I understand, sir. Now. You feel an overwhelming, barely resistible urge to fulfill his demand. So this guy totally has the discipline of dominate, and it doesn't actually mean particularly that he has to be Ventru, for example, or some different clan, because in the new setting, uh, of course, you are inclined more to have some specific disciplines, for example, traders very often have presence, but you can also learn the disciplines of the other clans. So we don't really know his clan yet, but he does use a discipline in here, I believe, probably mesmerize or compel. What are you talking about? 
can you just tell me what is going on here? No, and that is your first strike. <sighs> alright, have you got anyone who you'd like to inform about your current situation and tell them you're alright? He flashes his fangs briefly as he talks, and for some reason the sight causes a chill to run down your spine. Something's wrong with him. Someone closest to you? L lie. Um, his name is Eduardo, he's my boyfriend, he lives in Queens, he's a barista and a... A stranger has been watching you with very eyes since the moment you started talking, but only interrupts you at the first moment of visible hesitation. You're a hundred years too young to try and fool me, whelp. Even your tells have tells. Second strike. Try again. Your first instinct is to protest, but you realize your thoughts are still too scrambled and panicked to come up with anything coherent. You give up on all planned attempts to provide poor Eduardo with convincing psychological depth. E Emma, my sister, she's probably having a night out in Brooklyn with her artist friends. Uh, can I call her now? You take out your phone while asking the question. He shakes his head and points at the hooded corpse next to him. If you want to implicate her, go ahead. I think we'd all be better off if you let me make sure that she only knows what she needs to know. Yeah, agreed. Give me her phone number. I have someone get in touch with her. You oblige and hand him the smartphone so he can copy the number from your list of contacts. Thank you. This will be useful in illustrating my next point. Instead of giving you back your phone, the man hides it in his pocket. From this night onwards, you are subject to different laws than the ones you grew up with, and you will be watched by many eyes to ensure these laws are respected. You are forbidden from letting anybody you know you're still alive. You are forbidden from showing your face anywhere they know you. If anyone comes to search for you, it's over, both for you and them. He interrupts his mountain recitation to stare deep into your eyes. So if you don't want someone to find your poor sister's body in the Hudson River next week, cooperate. The set of his fangs again and another physical fight or flight response. You've played right into his hands, putting him in danger. I can only hope that you care for her enough not to do anything selfish. By now you're absolutely sure he's just toying with you, provoking you just to feed on your reactions. He hasn't told you where you're going yet, but he's already made it abundantly clear that a lot of people struggled hard to avoid getting there. You'd be far more eager to cooperate if he never raised the subject, but he made it a point to make you fear the unknown. He's pushing you, but to what end? Does he want you to intimidate you into complete submission? Is he hoping you'd give him an excuse to get rid of you? Or maybe he's testing you, forcing you to show what you're made of. Somehow, he makes all of these options seem plausible at once. Alright, I think that's enough lectures for today. He takes a glance at his silver watch. It's Patek Philippe, the kind of brand mere mortals never see outside of luxury lifestyle magazines. Just who are you dealing with here? It's past 3 a.m. now. The sun will come up in just a few hours, so we don't have much time. Come, we need to leave so that the corpse can be taken care of. He turns his back on you to unlock the door. Head out. Okay. You obediently follow him out of the room. Before he locks it again, you manage to take a final glimpse of the corpse. You feel a pang of conscience, but not because of your victim's horrible fate. It's because you don't feel guilty even though you know you should. Something important inside of you that was still there yesterday has definitely died tonight. You wonder if you'd ever recognize, even recognize yourself in the mirror. The stranger shows you to the elevator. You go to the ground floor. During an awkward ride, your dazed and confused mind desperately searches for a glimmer of hope and eventually comes across one. Maybe you'll find the man you met earlier this night. Maybe. <sighs> what happened to that man? Do you know what happened to the man who brought me here? That's what I'd like to know. As of yet, he is unidentified. They have left no trace and it's obvious they are not planning to come back for you. If, and that's a big if, you ever see them again, it will be tomorrow and probably for the last time. Hmm, trial! For the last time? What do you mean? His face is inscrutable. 
I said what I said. Not like an ad for an hour, tomorrow is a big night for you. We're probably going to be put in front of the prince, as usually with Vampire the Masquerade games. <laughs> Just like Balance 1 and Balance 2 are starting. The elevator doors open to an empty hall. You walk outside, past the night guard's post, which is empty. The cold night air reminds you of the balcony. Just a few hours ago, the man motions to a black Cadillac Escalade. Take a seat in the back, please. You get inside. The man closes the car door behind you. You hear a click as it locks. The Cadillac is almost entirely dark. The side windows seem lightproof. The man gets in the driver's seat, starts the engine, and drives away without comment. Where are we going? A safe place. Forgive me, I'm not in a talkative mood. This won't be a long drive. Patience. That silence fills the car. You close your eyelids and sink back into your thoughts. A blurry after image of the man who bought your painting is still there. It's strange. You never felt this way about anybody. It makes you happy, even though you have the nagging thought that there is something fundamentally abusive about this attraction. But then the girl's hair spilled over the purple hoodie, and her blood spilled over the cold floor, coming to sharp focus. You wince. You want to cry, but it's as if there were no more tears left in you. By the way, vampires can cry, okay? They can cry bloody tears, and uh, when they use the blush of life, I mean, it depends on the storyteller, but this is how I used to play. Um, when you use the blush of life, your bodily fluids, they do look more human, humane. So uh, you do actually have tears, real tears. After what feels like an eternity, the car comes to a stop. You get out in an underground parking lot. It's an ugly, concrete, grey thing. Empty, but for the car you came in. It looks like there is a room beyond the metal door in the wall. Guess you'll live to see another night. Follow me. He opens the metal door and lets you inside. Here we are. These are your lodgings for tonight. If you get hungry, again, take a look into the fridge. Tomorrow I will come pick you up. The cramped room has no windows, just a simple bed, a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling, a small humming fridge and a rattling AC fan in the wall. It has all the coziness of a solitary prison cell, you notice know, claw marks on the inner side of the entrance door. I need medical help. I can't feel myself breathing. I can't sense my heartbeat. I, I need to go to a hospital, man. You're gonna be fine. Now listen, normally I'd lose my nerve right about now and things would get nasty, but I get it. You're scared. You don't understand what happens. Trust me, you will learn more tomorrow. But now, I need you to rest. And you need you to rest. He gestures inside the room. Finding no more willpower to resist, you step inside. The stranger nods constantly. That's actually interesting, because you can use willpower in the V5 system to um, either resist, um, maybe not resist, let's say that you can resist your own failures. So basically, you can resist someone trying to dominate you uh, when you roll against them and you fail, you can use your willpower to try to succeed. And uh, your willpower meter is very similar to your health meter, actually. And you can lose your willpower and then you can regain them in time. And it's a pretty interesting system which allows you to um, focus, to try to fix your worst mistakes and, for example, avoid frenzy, avoid uh, losing horribly in particular roles, but you cannot do it too much because uh, you will become impaired if you do so. Good night. He locks the door behind you. It looks very secure and sturdy. You open the fridge. There's a single plastic bag there, filled with red liquid, and labeled tomato soup? You feel sick to your stomach. Best leave it for now. Tomato soup, really? You lie down on the bed. It's a simple mattress on the metal frame, kind of grimy and damp. Seeing it makes you grimace, but you're just too tired not to lie down. Your entire body hurts, a dull feeling that makes you feel heavy. You feel vulnerable and lonely. Usually, when that happens, you turn your attention to painting, just to not think about the alternative. 
Your family upbringing left you with no skills but artistic talent. Creating art used to be something of an unpleasant duty. Somewhere along the line, though, it became the only weapon you had to fight with existential despair. Some of your best work was created in lieu of impotently crying in bed. Hell, you're pretty sure a few of those pieces had your tears mixed in with the paint. Like the painting that led your whole night to this. You look back at your life and it starts looking like a downward spiral. You are so tired, your entire body tenses up and before you know it, you drift away into oblivion. You wake up. And this is where we will end it for today, guys. Uh, this is the very first episode, the introductory episode to Vampire the Masquerade Coteries of New York. I'm very happy to be able to play this game for you and let me know what you think so far. I feel like this beginning was pretty atmospheric and I can't wait to see what's more in there. See you later, don't get lost in the night and goodbye.